In this tenth portion of our material, we're going to see an example of how central, how basic, and how important the identification truths are, how they permeate every realm of Christian life and Christian development, Christian service. And at this, at this time, we must consider uh, the law in relation to Christian life. Law came by Moses, and grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> First and foremost, the believer, of course, is not under law, and his life is not ready to be governed by law at all. We're going to think about this for a time together. Actually, most Christians are, in their attitude and in their everyday life, they are under the law. At least they think they are. At least much of their Christian life is governed by the principle of law. I must do this and I mustn't do that. And, of course, that produces and results in uh, Romans 7 experience, a struggle. And... It just is not, the law is not geared for uh, the Christian life. And the law was introduced by God for a very specific purpose, and it was introduced for a very specific time in his overall plan and, and economy. It had its purpose. But the law has no purpose actually in the Christian life. The law has already done its work. And um, we want to see how how this uh, how the law relates to the Christian life in our time here. If we look into Galatians three, <coughs> three seventeen and on we can see how God introduced the law for a time and for a specific purpose. Galatians 3.17 The covenant which God had already formally made was not abrogated by the law which was given 430 years later so as to annul the promise. In other words, uh, God made a covenant and a promise to Abraham, to Abram but when he introduced the law later, the law did not annul the promise. The law was for a specific purpose. For if the inheritance comes through obedience to law, it no longer comes because of promise. But as a matter of fact, God has granted the inheritance to Abraham in fulfillment of a promise. Why then was the law given? It was imposed later on, 430 years later, Later on, for the sake of defining sin, until the seed should come to whom God had made the promise. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? No, indeed. For if a law could have been given, which could have conferred life, righteousness would certainly have come by law. But Scripture has shown that all mankind are the prisoners of sin, in order that the promised blessing which depends on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, may be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were perpetual prisoners under the law, living under restraints and limitations, in preparation for the faith which was soon to be revealed. So that the law has acted the part of a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, in order that through faith we may be declared to be free from guilt. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are all sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Galatians 3, 17 to 19 and 21 to 26. The law came to reveal sin. We think of Romans 5, 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So the law had a specific work to do. 
to uh, <clears throat> cause men to realize that they were sinners and uh, thereby be directed to and uh, driven to, one might say, through their need, driven to the Lord Jesus and uh, led to the Lord Jesus by, as a schoolmaster. Um, the law showing them their need for him. But faith is and faith always has been God's means of working both for birth and for life. Faith. We look in Galatians 3 again, in Galatians 3, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Cursed is every one that continueth not. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith, not, not simply be born by faith, born again by faith, but to live by faith. For without faith it is impossible to please God. <clears throat> and every believer actually knows that the law does not and cannot save. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by law, then Christ is dead in vain. And we think of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Christian learns in the very beginning God's principle, God's means of working, basic means of working, which is by faith in the finished work and not by law. But even though all Christians realize this as far as their new birth is concerned, few Christians realize that their Christian life is to be lived on the same basis, on the same principle, by faith and by faith in a finished work, in the finished work. And that's where our identification truths bring this out so beautifully. Uh, as far as uh, our substitutionary truths are concerned, uh, the law made claims upon uh, the sinner. The man, the soul that sinneth it shall die, and... Uh, if the law is broken on any one point, it's broken altogether. Wages of sin is death. And uh, the law helped to convict the sinner of his sin. But that the only reason for that was that he might come to the Lord Jesus and be saved by faith. So we learned the part of the law, the part the law plays. We learned that when we were saved. But we have to learn that for our Christian walk and our Christian life also. That uh, Because most Christians feel, well, I, yes, I was saved by faith, but now to, in order to live a Christian life, I must uh, seek to keep the Ten Commandments. And uh, God, now that I'm saved, God will help me. God will assist me. No, that, that is not, the, the Christian life is not based on that principle at all. And that, that's where, of course, the identification truths help us to see that uh, the life, the old life, which is the life that is under the law, one might say, the life that seeks to respond to the law, uh, has been taken down into death, and that we're now alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And that we are out of the realm of the law. We've been taken on to new ground, on the resurrection ground, where the law cannot reach. And so that the Christian is free from the domination of the law, and he's free to live in grace, and he has freedom in Christ Jesus. And of course, the law calls for uh, a high standard, a higher standard than, than uh, the natural man can attain to. But the Lord Jesus goes beyond the law, actually. He, uh, if one reads the Sermon on the Mount, he'll see that there, that is far beyond the law. 
what the law calls for. Uh, the law doesn't require one to go the second mile or turn one's cheek, but uh, the Lord Jesus is the Lord Jesus is superior to the law. He's the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. So that uh, a Christian needn't be upset when that at the very thought of of turning from the law, because as he grows in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to. Uh, the Lord Jesus is going to take him beyond what the law calls for. <clears throat> but uh, most uh, most believers are uh, struggling under what they feel is their responsibility to the law. And since uh, they cannot keep the law in their own strength, and since God isn't going to assist them to keep the law, he's working on an altogether different principle, there's failure. So actually the law is working in the Christian life also, as it did in the sinner's life. It's showing him his failure. It's showing him his sin. But this struggle with the law, it builds up a tremendous guilt complex in most Christians. And they're carrying this weight of guilt upon their hearts constantly. They may not realize what it is, but it's there. It's a, a vague and sometimes not so vague pressure and weight and a, a sorrow, sort of an agony of heart of failure and guilt well this is the law working and it presses one down because the law brings forth death not life and uh, hard as it is and bad as it is it actually is uh, a good thing because this very need and burden is going to uh, bring the Christian to the freedom that is in the Lord Jesus Christ it's going to bring the Christian forward to find out what God's answer is to this and, of course, he's going to realize that the Lord Jesus is his life. He's going to begin to abide in him and rest in him and uh, learn something of what... He's going to learn something of what um, um, grace really means in the Christian's walk. Paul, in talking to the Galatians, of course, the book of Galatians was written by Paul to the people of Galatia, the Christians in Galatia, because of this very problem that the Galatian Christians were seeking to, uh, although they were born again and saved by faith, they were seeking to live by the law. And Paul uh, confronted them in Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? This only will I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made mature by the flesh? And of course not. And even if uh, one could, even if the Christian could live a good Christian life in his own effort, uh, the very nature of self would be that this pride would spring up at the very attainment the very ability to live the Christian life uh, would uh, there would be a tremendous amount of pride there. No, the, the flesh, the old life is not the old nature is not the nature that has it can have anything to do with uh, the Christian walk. It can have nothing to do with it. Romans eight seven, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And there's enmity there. And there's no possibility for the old life to uh, produce and to line up. God can't accept it. And it isn't just that God can't accept the old life, the self-life, because it's sinful. That's enough. But the fact that God has already dealt with the old life, God has already taken it to the cross, God has already crucified it, God has already taken it down to death. And he's through with it. And when we begin to see what God has done with our old life, the I life, the self life, we can turn from it also. When we see the work of the cross and to see that we're already freed from the dominion of self. And we learn to count ourselves dead indeed unto self. That we have died out of the realm of the old. And that we're now new creations in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're alive unto God in Christ. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And we learn to abide and to rest in our new life. And, of course, that releases us from all the struggle and the attempt to produce. And we can uh, abide. 
and allow him to carry on his work for it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure and of course if the heart is constantly upset and guilt ridden and uh, struggling to produce that is no condition for the inner man uh, one's heart and soul to be in for the Holy Spirit to do his work he, he, he does not carry out his ministry of um, giving us the things of Christ while we're all upset and we're not walking by faith it must be a quiet heart, a heart arresting, resting in the Lord Jesus, a heart that has confidence in him, a heart that exercises faith, a heart that is not upset. That is the atmosphere, so to speak, in which the Holy Spirit can carry out his ministry. We must walk and live and stand by faith. And he, he does not carry out his ministry on, a, on any other basis but by faith, as we exercise faith. And, of course, he... His ministry also, as the Spirit of Truth, He shows us the Word, He shows us the truth, He reveals the truth to us so that we can have faith. He shows us the facts so that we can rest in them. And that is why it's so vital for the Christian to see the facts of his identification in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the cross, that he might rest in these truths, that he might reckon them so. He might count it to be true. But it's impossible to reckon until we're sure. Then, then reckoning becomes effortless because the reckoning means to count upon something and you can't count upon something you're not sure of. But if you see the truth in the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit has given you that truth where you're assured of it and rest upon it, reckoning comes without effort. It becomes a natural attitude of the Christian. He sees himself out of the realm of the old, dead, dead to it. Death separates him from it now and he... He counts upon that death, that finished work of death at Calvary, and the Holy Spirit begins to apply that death to the old life, holding it in the place of death as he, as uh, the Christian maintains that attitude, as he walks by faith in that fact. So we're still to move and think and study within uh, the framework of uh, doctrine. We must not get out of line in our thinking and in our study. We must uh, see the correct doctrine concerning the law and its relationship to the born-again believer. In order to do this, we must turn to uh, an area in the Word that is... Uh, seemingly quite neglected and that's the first part of Romans 7 and most Christians uh, once they begin to grow they're very familiar with the, the center and latter part of Romans 7 having to do with struggle and all but they seem to skip over the first few verses of Romans 7 which are extremely important very revealing Romans uh, 7 1 to 6 for instance And there is a key here, there is a wonderful truth here that has to do with our identification. All of these things tie into identification. In Romans 7, 1, and Paul uses the same term that he uses in Romans 6, Know ye not? Know ye not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? And here is the, uh, this brings us to our identification truth. And he gives a, um, he gives a, an, an illustri illustration here, a picture of uh, marriage. And know ye not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress 
though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. And there is here is where Paul brings in the identification truth again. Know ye not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? And of course the Christian has died in Christ. When the Lord Jesus died, the Christian died. And the Lord Jesus was not only taking us, in his death was not only taking us out, out from under the dominion of self and sin, out of the realm of sin. He was not only doing that, but he was taking us out from under the dominion of the law. Death now separates the Christian from the law. And as we think of later on in Galatians about the fact that Paul said that he glories in the cross, whereby he is crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified to him. And our death in the Lord Jesus also separates us from the uh, dominion of the world and of the enemy. Death has cut us off from these elements, these spheres. And as a Christian sees these facts and begins to rest in them, he begins to get the benefit of them, freedom from all of these different dominations that ruin the Christian life and make him a slave. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And, of course, we are born into the Lord Jesus. We're one with him, just as uh, two married people are, in God's eyes, have been made to be one. We're one with the Lord Jesus by nature. And the very nature of our relationship to the Lord Jesus as he is the vine and we are the branches, that uh, that relationship is will bring forth fruit as the branch abides in the vine. And the fruit, of course, will be of the nature of the vine, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, and peace, long-suffering, and so forth, the very characteristics of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And uh, that's all that the law can do, is to show us that we're dead, to, to bring forth death in our lives as we try to keep the law and fail. And it shows us that we're sinners. And the law is actually to reveal death. That's the function of the law, not life, death. And uh, the law revealed sin working in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And the Christian finally cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, this body of death? And the carnal, struggling Christian, all that he can produce is death. And he finally becomes aware of it. And he hungers for life, and the Lord Jesus Christ is life, and the Lord Jesus Christ is his life, but he hasn't really been aware of it. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we, sh we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. There is a... Coney Bear has an interesting uh, rend uh, rendering of this verse. of um, Romans 7, 6. Now that we have died with Christ, the law wherein we were formerly held fast has lost its hold upon us, so, so that we are no longer in the bondage of the letter, the letter of the law. This whole area is talking about the law, and the law is the letter, the letter of the law, so that we are no longer in bondage of the letter. But in the new service, of the Spirit. And 
that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That the new life of the Lord Jesus Christ, spiritual matter, a natural, normal matter, a flowing of life, not a struggle and effort to produce. And the Lord Jesus said that the, br the branch does not produce, but the vine produces. Well, for without me you can do nothing, he said. And the law calls for production. But grace calls for reception. And we think again of Romans 7, 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. And that's the perfect picture of the vine. And we think of uh, Romans 6, 14, the same truth, all this being tied together. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And, uh, of course, uh, when one is under the law, he, he is aware of the dominion of sin. That's the function of the law. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And we remember how uh, Paul mentioned in Galatians 2, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. And, uh, of course, the law slew Paul. The law, the law came in and uh, showed Paul as a Christian that he couldn't live the Christian life in his uh, in the natural life and uh, Romans 7 is a picture of Paul's struggle under the law seeking to be live the Christian life by by seeking to keep the law and he said that the law slew him the law showed him that in himself was nothing but death and the law showed him his sin and uh, the law finally called him to cry out O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of the bo this body of death and that's the function of the law, to uh, drive us to life, that I might live unto God. So this is a very wonderful truth uh, of how the Christian may escape from the domination of the law. And it's the same principle by which he escapes from the domination of sin, by which he escapes from the domination of self by which he escapes from the domination of the world, by which he escapes from the domination of the enemy. And anything that would dominate him, not by seeking not to do things, not by seeking and struggling to, to do better and to resist things. Uh, as a matter of fact, we think of the verse, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, that doesn't mean a stiffening of the spine and a clenching of the teeth and uh, to resist. It doesn't mean that. That would be law the resistance that the word of God calls for is that the Christian apply to the work that God did and concerning the enemy that the Christian was crucified with the Lord Jesus and taken down into death and he was risen anew on risen ground in the, in the risen Lord Jesus Christ where the enemy can't reach him, can't touch him he's, hidden, he's hid with Christ in God He's not on the ground where the enemy can touch him. And there, there is the resistance to Satan that will cause him to flee. Nothing, absolutely nothing, will cause the enemy to flee except the work of the cross, the finished work of the cross, where he was defeated, where he was completely defeated at Calvary. And that's the only thing that will cause him to back off. So resistance, any resistance to the enemy or any other, to the self or sin of the world or anything that would encroach upon the, the life of the believer, the resistance is at Calvary. And that's why the Christian is called to uh, count himself dead indeed unto sin, and dead indeed unto the law, and dead indeed unto the world, and dead indeed unto the enemy, and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. There is the resistance, and not by uh, resolutions, and not by reconsecrations, and not by help from uh, others praying for him, and not by um, saying, uh, Lord, I'll never do that again, and all of these... Uh, functions of the law, nothing, nothing uh, is effective except the finished work of the cross. And that's why it's important for the Christian to see this truth, because we go by truth. The truth shall make you free. And we have to find out what the truth is, and then rest in it. And you cannot rest in anything you're not sure of. And that's why we're so explicit about these identification truths. That's why we should be so explicit about the justification truths when we're seeking to win someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that they have every opportunity to see clearly the facts before they are called upon to make a move. Then they'll be strong, then they'll be healthy, then they'll grow. And they'll save the Christian a lot of effort and heart, heartache and struggle and a few will work later on with a convert if, he, if, he's, if he's born healthily and there's a, a good thorough work done even before he's saved, he'll grow. But otherwise, the Christian is going to have a lot of heartbreak with his so-called convert. And it's not fair to the convert. It's not fair to those who are looking on. It uh, doesn't glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth must be set forth in love and uh, given time where the Holy Spirit can apply it. And he never applies the truth to an unprepared heart, never. That is a very definite principle. So it's important for the Christian to really study these um, first six verses of Romans 7. Extremely important area in the Word. Very valuable, wonderful picture of the truth of identification. Know ye not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. We were identified with him. We were in Christ when he died that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto God, uh, bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And the basic problem is that most Christians do not know that they have been delivered from the dominion of sin. They do not know that they've been delivered from the domination of self. They do not know that they have already been delivered from the dominion of the law and of the enemy. And there is a lack of knowledge, vital knowledge. They do not know. They have not been shown. Patiently and carefully shown. Explicitly shown. On the basis of the word. And if a person doesn't know that he's free, how can he gain the benefit of that freedom? Like the man uh, sitting on the curb... Uh, crying because he's hungry and uh, lost and no one to help him where all the time he may be an heir to a vast fortune that he's not aware of and that if he were aware of it he would take advantage of, of it all and not be in that condition simply because he didn't know and that's the same old story with uh, most believers that uh, they are not growing in grace and in the knowledge of their Lord Jesus Christ. They do not know what is theirs in Him. And so they seek to get along as best they can and get along on their own. And of course that is futile and means absolute failure as Romans 7 so graphically proves. <clears throat> Andrew Murray wrote that uh, almost every believer makes the same mistake as the Galatian Christians. Very few learn at once that it is only by faith that we stand and walk and live. They have no conception of the meaning of Paul's teaching about being dead to the law, freed from the law, about the freedom with which Christ made us free. Regarding the law as a divine ordinance for our direction, they consider themselves prepared and fitted by conversion to take up the fulfillment of the law as a natural duty. They cannot understand that it is not to the law but to a living person that we are now bound, and that our obedience and holiness are only possible by the unceasing faith in his power and life ever working in us. 
For it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Not I, but Christ. For to me to live is Christ. And the, the, the normal thinking is that, well, when we're saved, and now we'll have the help of God and the work of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live within the realm of the law and keep the law. And, of course, God has no idea of this. There's no thought of this. The Lord Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. And he uh, he, well, he lived under the law, and he fulfilled the law. He did not fulfill the law for us. He fulfilled the law in order that he might be perfect before God, so that he could be the perfect Savior and go up on the cross as a perfect sacrifice. That's why he kept the law, so that he, 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 just, he did not sin. He fulfilled all of the requirements so that he could be the sacrifice. And then, of course, in the midst of that sacrifice, he took us down into death, out of the realm of all of these influences, the sin and the law, self, the world, dead indeed unto the world, and alive unto God in Christ. And so that most believers today cannot understand that it is not to the law but to a living person that we are bound, and that our obedience and holiness are only possible by the unceasing faith in his power and life ever working in us, that we might uh, rely upon him and draw from him. That is the Christian walk, that is Christian life. And Metcalf mentions, it is perhaps the most alarming symptom of decay to be seen among evangelical believers today that so many having accepted, at any rate mentally, the fact that they cannot be justified before God except by the sacrifice for sin made once for all upon Calvary, they see that they're saved by faith, but they proceed to build up a new legal code by which to live and seek to be sanctified by their own efforts and, and endeavors. And isn't that true? Uh, one thinks of the average fundamental sound church, that... Uh, we have certain rules and certain stipulations and understanding that the Christian will not go to movies and the Christian will not smoke and go to dances and uh, different things. And many are responding to these things simply because that's the rule. Well, that's law. And uh, the growing Christian has no heart for those things. His heart is uh, hidden in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's taken up with other things, things that have to do with the Holy Spirit, things that are within uh, the will of the Lord. And the same uh, is with the uh, same thing with many of our Christian campuses. Uh, certain rules, uh, uh, the students have to sign certain things that they won't won't do these things. Well those who are growing and uh, are developing they don't really have to sign those things they don't want to do those things and many of them who do sign them are continually hankering after them and many of them uh, go ahead and when they can get away with it they do these things I, I know this very well I, I had a lot of experience with campuses it's only natural it's a carnal young carnal Christian attitude so often but uh, the rules and regulations that do not necessarily keep one from doing these things, and even if it does keep them from doing it, it may not keep them from hankering after, which is the same, might as well, the same thing. The heart is uh, reaching out in that direction. So the law is absolutely futile, and not the law never was meant to produce a good Christian life, never. It was uh, meant to show what the carnal life is like. It's meant to reveal sin. Newell has some good thoughts here. William R. Newell. It is a fatal perversion of the truth of God to teach, as did the Puritan theologians, that while we are not to keep the law as a means of salvation, we are under the law as a rule of life. Men have to be delivered from the whole legal principle, from the entire sphere where law reigns, before true liberty in Christ can be found. And this was done on the cross. There we died unto the law. We were there discharged from the law. 
and are now not under the law. Galatians 2.19, Romans 7.6, and Romans 6.14. And those who, with simple faith, believe these facts, enter the blessed realm where grace reigns, and the law of love is a delight, and where service is in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. There the Holy Spirit, dwelling in the believer, performs the will of God in the Christian, whose will, at last, is a delight. I delight to do thy will, O God. That's, there's the grace. The law can never produce that. If ministers and teachers of God's word would set saints free and establish them in Christ, let their preaching and teaching be along the lines of the 6th and 7th of Romans, the central theme of which is our union with Christ in death and burial, and our resurrection with him in the newness of life. We're not the law, not the letter, but grace reigneth. We're not the letter, but the spirit moveth the heart and life of God's saints. If God has declared that we died in Christ, we did die. If God has declared us discharged from the law, we are discharged and are thereby free, new creatures created after God in righteousness and true holiness. Our longing for conformity to the image of God's Son shall be confirmed and fulfilled by the Holy Spirit who hath been given unto us. No man can believe he has the right to walk freely and fully in the Spirit until he believes himself to be free from the law. And, of course, no man can get free from the law by struggle. The only possible freedom, God's freedom from the law, is death. Our death in Christ at Calvary. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and under the law. The only, only way, only possible way, God's way, is the cross, is Calvary. Theological teaching since the Reformation has not set forth clearly our utter end in death with Christ at the cross. And the Reformation brought out the birth truths, but it did not bring out the growth truths. The fatal result of this terrible error is to leave the law as claimant over those in Christ. For law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth, and if the man does not know that he has died in Christ, he's going to still remain under the law. He's going to feel that the law has dominion over him. And only the Christian who sees that he died out of the realm of the law and sin and self it has any chance at all. He's the only one that has any possibility of getting free from those nominations. So we see how clearly we must have our knowledge. We must see the truth. Unless we are able to believe in our heart that we died with him and that we were buried and that our history before God in Adam, the first, came to an absolute end at Calvary, we will never get free from the claims of law upon our conscience. And we must see our death at Calvary, that death now separates us from all that would hinder the Christian life. And that death brought us over on to uh, the resurrection ground in our risen Lord Jesus, who is our Christian life. And as we abide in him as a branch abides in the vine, there's going to be growth and there's going to be maturity. A healthy, normal, natural, flowing life. No effort involved whatsoever. And this, of course, brings us to Galatians 5.1, a verse that uh, Christians should spend years with and what this verse really means. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And it's there's only two areas for a Christian to live and walk in, and that is uh, liberty where he's been made free by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, or else it's a struggle and entanglement and bondage of the law, the yoke of bondage. It's either the yoke of Christ or the yoke of Moses, one or the other. And if the Christian uh, does not have his facts, there's only one thing for him, and that's struggle and effort and the law, the whip of the law. And death, death in his daily life just uh, can't bring forth fruit unto God. He just brings forth death. Everything is wrong. Everything is, uh, there's no life. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And we, we can only stand on the truth that we see. So the law does not have a claim upon the Christian, but it's up to the Christian to see this, to see where he has been freed and count himself dead indeed unto the law and alive unto God 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank Thee for Thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. How we thank Thee for this. And we look to Thee to continue to uh, reveal Thy truth to us, and that we might have, we pray that our faith might gain strength daily to rest and stand upon the truth that the Lord Jesus might evermore be seen in and through us, that we might more and more fully be conformed to the image of thy Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.